<clears throat> so last time we talked about what it would take to take your code and to make it into an actual website that people could could view around the world. And we talked about a lot of things, so I want to summarize that today. Um, first thing you would do, typically, would be you would uh, look for a web hosting company. You actually could host it yourself, but it's one of those things like, yeah, it's probably more trouble than it's worth, given that for a very small amount of money, you can get a hosting service to do it. It's their job to do it. They'll do things like backups and apply patches for security and all that kind of stuff. And so therefore, kind of why bother? Maybe a larger organization, but even a larger organization might look and say, eh, you know, it's not worth it for us to do it. This is, you know, one less thing that we have to worry about. So we're going to do the assumption that you're going to hire a web hosting company. Now, one thing when looking for a web hosting company, you should be aware of looking for one that supports the specific technologies that you're going to employ. And this gets into server-side scripting, which we're going to touch on today. But if you know, for example, that you're going to use ASP.NET, you want to make sure that your hosting company supports ASP.NET. Same thing with PHP and so on. All right? What do you get when you hire a hosting company? You get space on a server of theirs, and you get software that allows you to put your site, put your uh, code up on their server, and allow people to view it. That would be web server software and FTP software and all that. But any machine isn't necessarily a web server. It has to have be running web server software, which means that it has to be able to listen to and respond to requests for web pages. And generally speaking, there is IIS, which is a Microsoft web server, and there is Apache, which is an open source web server. For the most part, uh, in the web world, there is your choice for a website would be to use Microsoft technologies or to use open source technologies. So you might have a Windows server running IIS that supports ASP.NET, or you might have a Linux server, which is open source, running Apache, which is open source, running PHP, or some other language, which would probably be open source. It's not cut and dry, but if you're going to talk about most common cases. So first thing you would do is you would have a web hosting company. And a web hosting company would give you either a server of your own or a server that you would share with other customers. One on your own, of course, is going to cost more money because it gives you more resources on your own. Some web servers have a thing where you're allowed up to so many bytes or gigabytes transfer per month or something like that. Some have unlimited. But you get a web server, either a dedicated web server, which costs more, or a shared hosting, which costs less. And it would, the web server would have the server software, which again is either Apache or IIS. And you'd have some space to put your code. You would also need to register your domain. And what's your domain? Your domain is your web address. So remember we talked about that every machine has an IP address, which is for four numbers from 0 to 255, which is like the address of the server. That's how you refer to the server. People don't do good at remembering that, so you would hire, uh, or you would purchase a domain name and have it registered with DNS servers, which would be, which would map www.mynewwebsite for CISS216.com to this IP address. So people would only have to type in your URL and then 
would go from there. So then clients would request a page. The DNS would make sure it translated it to the right IP address. The protocols that are followed, the internet, uh, a TCP IP protocol and HTTP protocol would make sure that the request went to the right place and the request would come back to the right place. And there you go, you have your web page. Your web page would have a root directory, which is like your assignments root directory. Your home page would likely be called something like index.html. That's a common name for uh, a home page on a website. And then you could build up folders. So if you had a page, if you had a section about your photo galleries, you could have your URL slash gallery slash the names of the pages and the names of the images. And that would be a folder on the physical machine somewhere. You then have some kind of software, FTP software or otherwise, that would allow you to transfer from your development machine up to your place on the web server where your uh, code was to live. And that would be publishing the website. All right. Now, again, this is sort of a, just an overview, simplified. There's a lot of variations, but this is sort of the basic ideas on how your website would go live. Now, we're going to still talk about web servers, but we're going to switch gears a little bit. There's certain things on the web that if you think just about plain old HTML and CSS, don't make sense. All right? You talk just about plain old HTML and CSS, doesn't make sense. One of those is a Google search. <coughs> Let's think about if a Google search was done with only HTML code, what that means. And we're going to find very quickly that we're going to be very confused because a Google search doesn't involve just HTML. It involves something else. So I go to Google. And I Google, first of all, this is suspicious, right? Right off the bat, we start typing and we get a list of suggestions, all right? But I go and I type in pizza places. All right. I'm kind of surprised by this one. They must have great pizza, right? Isn't Naples where pizza was invented? I think. So, well, okay, there you go. Uh, but if you notice some of these other things, all right, some of these other things make a little more sense for us. The 10 best pizza places in Elyria, TripAdvisor. The 10 best pizza places near Elyria, Ohio. Sambino's Pizza, which, oh, well, there you go, is in Elyria. Cozaria's Pizza, Elyria. Pizza Hut on Broad Street. Angelina's Pizza, which, spoiler alert, is probably in Elyria or nearby. Now, let's think about this if this was just HTML. All right? Couple things. Does that mean in every city in the country there's an HTML page? with a list of their most popular pizza parlors? No. That's absurd. You couldn't possibly have that, right? I mean, it doesn't make sense. And you know what? Even if it did make sense, even if it did, which it didn't, all right, how does it know we're in Elyria? Did I type in pizza places near Elyria? No, I just typed in pizza places. And it knew I was in Elyria. All right, and uh, it gave me a list of pizza places near where I live, all right, or near where I'm at. Uh, if 
we did the same thing with Chinese restaurants. China Star in Sheffield, Cleveland Street in Elyria, Cobblestone Road just down the street, 10 best Chinese restaurants near Elyria, and so on down the line, China Walk, Elyria, and all that. Now, are we so lucky that Elyria has the best Chinese restaurants and best pizza places in the world? Probably not. All right. So something is going on here. All right. Something different than plain old HTML is going on here. Because if you think of it, if you were to make a web page using just HTML of the best pizza places in your hometown, all right, whatever your hometown is, make a, a, a best pizza places there, and you put it up on the web, it wouldn't matter where the person looked at it. They would see the best pizza places in your hometown, right? Because that's how HTML works. If you were to open up your HTML assignments, your first assignment or your second assignment or your third assignment, it's going to look exactly the same as the day that you turned it in. Okay? Those kinds of pages are called static pages. All right? This kind of stuff, obviously something else is going on, and we'll explain what's going on in a minute, but these are called dynamic pages. Dynamic pages are pages that change without someone explicitly changing the code. In other words, two different people can get the different results. All right? Now, another example of this is if you go to Amazon. How many products does Amazon sell? A lot. Thank you. I mean, literally in the millions, I would think. All right. Uh, let's look at the bunny. Oh, there's a bunny. How nice. And look at this web page. What do we have? We have a picture of the bunny. You can zoom in on the bunny. There's some information about what the product is. There's a rating for it. There's a price. A more detailed description. Related to this item. Other things that the customer shopped for. Customers who bought this item also bought this item and down the line. We click another item. If you look at that, the structure of the page is basically the same. All right? The nav we didn't even talk about the top of the page, but on the top of the page is the navigation, and uh, below that, same idea. Picture that you can zoom in on, title of the product, price, ratings, uh, more description, frequently bought together, sponsored products, customers also shop for, and so on down the line. If these were each separate HTML pages, there'd be some real busy web developers in the world, right? Because they would have to be cranking out literally millions of pages. And when you think about it, even if they got done, they couldn't even take a day off, right? Because every day, new stuff comes out. New DVDs are released. Uh, new digital music is released. New books are released. New magazines. New everything is released every day. So there's, it, would be, it would be interesting to see how many products are added to Amazon each day. It's probably amazing. So we kind of get the sense that that would not be practical to have a bunch of web pages out there, each one custom crafted like we've crafted our pages in this class. It would simply be too overwhelming of work. Not to mention the whole idea of what if you actually choose to buy one of these. It goes to your shopping cart, you go and click on a button to purchase it, it charges your credit card, and so on. None of those things even remotely resemble anything we've done in HTML. So something different has to be going on for pages like this. 
And that difference is what we call dynamic web pages, and it involves the process of having server-side scripts, or server-side scripting. Now, server-side scripting is a generic term, all right? In other words, I'm not talking, when I say server-side scripting, I'm not talking about a particular programming language. There's a number of ways that you can do server-side scripting. It'd be like referring to an automobile, right? An automobile is just a generic term for something that gets you from A to B, all right? But I could be talking about a Ford, I could be talking about a Chevy, I could be talking about a BMW, I could be talking about, uh, you know, a Toyota, whatever, all right? But there may be differences and variances in how each of those are made and how they work, right? A Prius works different than a, uh, a, a gas-powered car, all right? But they're still all automobiles because they still basically do the same thing. So the inner workings are going to be a little different, perhaps, but the basic idea of what they accomplish are the same thing. So instead of having in static web pages, this code would be HTML code. along with CSS and other stuff. And when a user made a request for one of your pages, the server would have a real easy job. All the server would do would be to find the files and deliver them. That's the server's job, a web server's job, with static pages. Doesn't have to do anything else but that. Finds it and delivers it. Think of the person that works at McDonald's during the lunchtime rush, right? They've cranked out Big Macs and fries and hamburgers and quarter pounders and chicken nuggets and all that, and they're just sitting in the bins waiting for someone to order them, all right? So when you go and place an order, all the server does at McDonald's is grab it out of the proper bin and give it to you. They don't really do anything more extensive than that. It's already pre-made, and they give it to you. All right? And that's how static pages work in HTML. You make a request, or the client makes a request. It goes to the internet, and a response comes back to the client, the customer, the user. Now, the thing about these static pages is they don't change. That's what word, the word static means in science. It means unchanging. All right? Which means that if you go and request a page on Monday, if you come back a month from now, if someone hasn't manually changed that page, you're going to get the exact same result. Now, compare that with dynamic web pages. Dynamic web pages are pages that change without really any specific changes to the code. So for example, if I were to search for pizza places in Illyria now and come back six months or a month even, maybe even a few days, I'm liable to get different results. Right? Why? Because pizza place is open, pizza place is closed, and so on. If I go to HBO's webpage now, it's probably going to tell me what's on tonight. Or, yeah, tonight, let's say, or, or now during the day. If I come back Friday, it's going to show me what's on Friday. Was there a web developer that went and manually changed that? No. The code is capable of changing and that's because these dynamic pages use server-side scripting. Now, what do I mean by server-side scripting? Examples of that are ASP.NET using C Sharp, PHP, Python, Ruby on Rails. There's a whole slew of them. But that's like Ford, Toyota, Prius, and so on. It's just different ways of doing essentially the same thing. These are actually programs, these server-side scripts. A script is essentially a program. Oh, how could we forget our friend Java? A script 
is a program. And those of you, and I hear in the lab people talking about taking C sharp and learn programming with loops and if statements and calculation statements and all that kind of stuff. There's none of that in HTML. That does exist, though, in server-side scripting. What also exists in server-side scripting is the ability to do database interactivity. So, does Amazon have a millions of HTML pages? No. Does Amazon have a millions of server-side scripts for each product? No. Amazon has one, I would expect, again, I don't know exactly, but theoretically it could have one product page, one server-side script that produces all the product pages that involves looking up the product information in a database and creating a web page for it. Okay? So... You want to create a new product in Amazon? You don't have to create a new web page. Just make sure that that data is entered into the database. And if that data is in the, in the database, then the product page will create it. It will show up on searches and so on. Does Google have different results pages? One for pizza in Illyria, one for Chinese restaurants in Illyria? No. It has one results page that uses Google's database and, and complex algorithms in the server-side search, a uh, server-side script, to go and access the database and create a page for you. Now, here's the thing about server-side scripting. All right? Server-side scripting is written in all these languages. And really, these languages contain some plain old HTML. So these languages, these, the scripting typically is a hybrid between some plain old HTML and code in other languages that outputs HTML, all right, that creates HTML by reading a database or doing whatever it needs to do. So you might ask the question, gee, why do we even bother studying HTML? Well, because these guys make HTML. So if you're going to write a program to make HTML, you better know how to write HTML yourself, right? If you're going to make a program to calculate the average of something, you need to know how to calculate averages, right? And then you can put down the instructions to do that, all right? So the thing about these server-side scripting languages is they're all their own languages. There's different kinds of languages. They contain some plain old HTML, but they also contain code in other languages. But when all is said and done, the exact same thing gets delivered to a client regardless if it's a static or a dynamic page. This client is probably someone running a web browser. And web browsers don't understand ASP.NET. They don't understand PHP and they don't understand any server-side language. What do they understand? They understand HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. All right? So, when I make a request now, if it's a dynamic page, it pulls up the script, and that script effectively writes, writes an HTML page just for my request. All right? So, for example, when I make a request, a bunch of information comes across with that request. One of them is my IP address. And the server, through looking up stuff and figuring it out, can figure out where I'm located based on my IP address, approximately. Knows I'm in Illyria, all right? Uh, sometimes you might be a little inaccurate. You know, but basically it knows I'm in the Lorain County area. All right? And therefore, this program can look for pizza places near Elyria, Ohio. And I didn't have to tell it I was in Elyria. It can do that because that's an additional piece of information that comes with the request. Your request has to, it has to include the IP address, right? Because you have to know where the answer is going to go back to. Right? 
So your IP address comes, the server can use that to figure out where you're from, and then look through the database to, to come up with a list of pizza places or Chinese restaurants or whatever that's close to where you live. But there's code that does that. There's database access that does that. It's not that there is an HTML page finished. The HTML page is made on the fly just for you. Like if you go to Subway. All right? If you go to Subway, do they have a bin of sandwiches sitting behind them like you have at McDonald's? No. What do they have? They have the ingredients and they have a server that runs a little recipe with you, runs a little algorithm with you. All right, you order a uh, chicken Caesar wrap. All right, so I say, I want a chicken Caesar wrap. They'll ask me, uh, well, what kind of wrap, spinach or tomato? All right, uh, they get information from me. They get more information from me. They get, uh, what kind of cheese do I want? Uh, what kind of vegetables do I want? Do I want any dressing on it? And so on. And they make it just for me. All right? It would be ridiculous to have, try to have a bin of every possible sandwich that you could order at Subway, right? Because if you did the math, with all the options they have, there'd literally be millions of them. Just like there's millions of search things that you could search for in Google. Just like there's millions of products in Amazon. So they don't try to store. They don't try to have completed sandwiches ready for you. They make one on the fly based on instructions and getting your user input. But when the day is done, you're still getting back a sandwich, right? Just like you got at McDonald's, all right? Because you, a consumer, you can't eat a recipe, right? You can only eat a completed sandwich. So where you order a sandwich, either a place where they're prepared and sitting for you, or a place where it's made, when the day is done, you get back a sandwich. Same thing here. You get back an HTML document with CSS, JavaScript, and other stuff. It's just a difference if that page is finished already and sitting there waiting for you, or if there's some programming that has to run in order to make that page on the fly for you. All right? So, we already talked about one way that a, a website can be dynamic, and that is it can use your IP address to figure out your location, or at least approximately your location. It knows the time of your request. So if I go to HBO's website, it's not going to show me what was on yesterday, it's going to show me what was on today. It right? doesn't have to be a change in the program. It just knows to take the current time and figure it out. What we're going to study next in this class is a way that you, as a user, whether you can provide to your user a way to give the server input data that it can go and do its thing on. And that is through the use of forms. When we think of forms, and by forms I mean text box, drop down, uh, comment areas, check boxes, radio buttons, submit buttons, all those things. All right? When we think of those, we're giving data to a server side script so it can do something with it. So let's imagine we go to Canvas, right? We go to Canvas, we request Canvas's homepage, we get back an HTML page. And that HTML page, it's going to have other stuff on it, but it's going to have a user ID and password and a submit button. I type that in. Maybe I get it right. Maybe I get it wrong. Let's say I get it wrong. I click submit. That sends the request to the server along with the data that I entered into the two text boxes, the user ID and password. The web server is going to go and look in the database and say, the server-side script is going to tell the web server to look in the database and say, hey, is there someone with that user ID and password? And if you entered it incorrectly, it's going to say, no, there isn't. So the web page that you get back is going to say, I'm sorry, no user exists. If I do that a second 
the, the server is going to, server side script is going to read the database, say, yes, that is the person. Here is their home page that has a list of all their classes that I pulled from the database. All right. So we take that form data and use it to read the database, make sure they're a legal login, and make sure that uh, uh, make sure that they're a legal login, and make sure uh, and then give them uh, the classes that they have. Same thing with a Google search. How do I know what the person's searching for? There's a text box. So there's a simple form that says, hey, go and this is the term that you want to search for. We're not going to study server-side scripting in this class because that's a separate topic, and that's a big topic all on its own. And that's included in a couple other classes, CISS 243, CISS 232. But we are going to study how you make a form, all right? and how you can make a form to send data to the server and get the response from the server. Now, in order to do this, we have to borrow a server from someone. All right, we have to borrow some server-side scripting. Uh, and there's a few things we could do. In this example, I'm going to borrow uh, Google's search. And I'm going to write my own HTML form to submit to Google's search. All right, and that's going to be our first step. So, so, like I said, I go to Canvas. All right, there's my form. This is a form. Text box, text box, and button. I type in my username. I type in my password. What happens when I click the submit button? That data gets sent to the Canvas web server. The server-side script on the Canvas side is going to do a database query to see is there someone with a username of those letters, and is there someone, and is there password, whatever letters I typed in? Of course there's not going to be, because I just hit any, just smash the keyboard. So it's going to send back an HTML page that says, sorry, it's not correct. All right? When I type in my right username and password, it's going to see that I am a legal user, and it's going to send me back a list of my courses, and, what's more, it knows for those courses that I'm the instructor, I'm not a student. All right? The server-side script is smart enough to give us different capabilities within the same class. Even though we're both part of the same class, I can grade stuff, and you can't. At this time of the semester, I was wishing that you could grade stuff too, because that would take a lot of load off of me, a lot of workload, but unfortunately that isn't the case. So I go and try to log in. Yeah, you guys probably wish it was too. I try to log in. I really upset it. It's going to come back eventually and tell me that that person doesn't exist. Yeah, incorrect user ID or password. So now I'm going to go in and enter the right thing. Click sign in, and boom, there I am, and I have my dashboard with all the classes that I teach. Google search. I go and I type something in. So let's do a search for HTML. It gave me a search on HTML. I do a search on CSS. Gave me a search on CSS. How does it know what to do a search for? It takes the value from my form and uses that in the server-side script to pull out the related pages. So that's what we're going to do. All right. 
I'm going to start out by making an HTML page that contains a form. And we're just going to do this about the simplest form that you can think of today. With just a single text box and a button. It's like all you need in a form. All you need in this form, that is. So I'm going to put my doc type on here. I'm going to put a form tag here, and I'm going to leave some space, because I'm going to put some stuff there. Think of the form tag as being an envelope, and everything enclosed in the envelope, everything enclosed in the form tag, you send to the server as a message. So we're starting out very simple, where we just have one thing that we're going to send to the server, just the thing that we're searching for. But, we could be sending a bunch of stuff, right? Think of the FAFSA form, all right? The FAFSA form, each page has at least a dozen fields in it, right? So, there's one form tag on that page because every time we click submit or go to the next page, we're sending everything that we entered in on that form in, an, in a little virtual envelope. And that's what the form tag is, a virtual envelope, everything in there, we're sending to the server as a unit. Okay. I'm going to put my form elements in an unordered list. Because really, not to get too philosophical about it, but that's what a form is, a list of things that you're sending to the server. So, might as well put it in an unordered list, because that's what it is. Now, for a text box, input type equals text, name equals Q. Then I'm going to have my submit button, input, type equals submit, name equals button submit, value equals search. All right, let's start off with that. Right now, I've coded just the look of the form. I haven't coded any of the functionality. So this form isn't going to work. It's just going to look like a form. All right? So I save that. And I'll save it as an HTML file on the desktop. And I'll call it search.html. So if I look at this in a browser, there we go. We have 
are four. We have a text box and we have a button. Doesn't do anything yet. Well, it does a little of something, but it doesn't do anything effective. All right? It does that, which really isn't any good. All right? Now. It tells you exactly. It tells you that I've entered something in on a form. All right? But it really doesn't do anything. Now, here's the thing. We want to send the data from our form to Google search engine, all right? And how do I send it to Google search engine? Well, there's two attributes on the form tag. One of them is the action attribute, and the other is the method. The action attribute is the name of the script that gets called when you do, when you hit the submit button. So let's go back to here. And I type in a search for HTML. And I click the submit button. I clicked the wrong thing. Shoot, HTML. Google search. This is the URL of the Google's server-side script that does searches. HTTPS, www.google.com, slash search. I'm doing a little bit of very simple reverse engineering. The URL of the server-side script is everything before the question mark. So in this case, I see that everything before the question mark I've highlighted. I'm going to copy that. And I'm going to put that as the action of my form. Now, the other thing I have to do is there's a couple of ways that I can send that data. If you notice, Google seems to be expecting the data on the query string. The query string is everything after the question mark. In fact, if I look real close, I can see what I typed in here. It says Q equals HTML. All right? So that's my query. That's my search query term. So I'm going to use a method of get. We'll talk a little bit more about methods later. But in a nutshell, get means put it on the query string. The other alternative for method is post, which means send it a different way. Now, here's the thing. Normally, you're writing both the client and the server code. So you know what you've called your server-side script, and you know whether it's expecting it on the query string or not. So you know those things. And in this case, though, since I didn't write the Google one, I have to do a little reverse engineering to look at what happens when I do a search and pull the names out. Now, if you notice, the name equals Q. It's no coincidence that I picked Q. All right? If I look up here, the name of this query field is called HTML. Or, I'm sorry, the name of my search field, HTML, is Q. Q equals this. The query string contains of a name of a field, an equal sign, and then the value. So I'm going to make sure that the name of this field is Q. Effectively what I'm doing is I'm giving the Google search engine the data where it expects to get it. So it will work. If I call it something else, it's expecting the thing I'm searching for to be called Q. If I call it something else, it's not going to work because it's not going to find the thing that I'm searching for. Likewise, if I called a different script other than Google Search Engine, well, it's not going to know what to do with it either, and it's going to mess up. So now, this ought to work. All right? And this isn't like hacking or anything. Google allows you to do this, right? They could have prevented me from doing this very simply if they didn't want me to reverse engineering. So 
they allow you to use their search engine in this manner. And I can go in and I can do a search by viewing this and when I type in HTML and click search, boom, there it goes. So my form gave it the data that it was looking for. And it gave it to it in the way that it expected. So notice the difference between their search and my search. They have a lot of extra stuff on their search. Mine only gave it the absolute minimum of what it needs. Q equals HTML and the submit button. Now, to, for my point later, if I called this something else, it doesn't work. It can't find the search query, so it panicked and sent me back to this page. All right? Likewise, if I get the name of this wrong, and I do a search, it gives me an error. It doesn't know anything about a URL called do something. So I have to get those parts right in order to provide Google with what it needs to do a search. I have to call the right server-side script and I have to call my things on the in the form by the right names. Okay? Questions about this? This is the basics of a form. We have a form tag that has two key attributes. A action and a method. Method could either be get or post. Google's expecting get, so I gave it get. Google is expecting this script to be called, so I gave it the script to be called. Finally, Google, Google is expecting the thing that I'm looking for to be called Q, so I call it Q. A submit button, when you click it, automatically calls this script, this URL, and adds the form data as part of the package that goes to the server. In this case, since I said get, it will send me, it will put the data on the query string. What happens if I you change this to put? That will be the last thing I'll try today. Depends if Google server is forgiving or not. Does Google server absolutely require you to have it on the query string? must be smart enough to figure it out. Yeah, it must be smart enough to figure it out. But still, we need, I'm going to put it back to get because that's what it is expecting. No, I'm wrong. It's not, it's not put, it's post. That's what I did wrong. I was surprised it didn't break. That's why I was had the dumb look on my face. All right, there. When I put the method to post, it didn't know what to do with it because it didn't find the data on the query string, and therefore um, it went on its way. HTML is the one that forgave me in that case, not Google, because Google saw put and thought, well, I don't know what put is, so I'll make it get. And it put the data on the query string. Yes? What was the post again? Post sends the data a different way, not on the query string. Sends it internally as part of the request, not as part of the URL. 
and Google is not expecting it to be there, so therefore Google doesn't know what to do with that search result, so it just takes me back to this page. In order to do it right, this should be get. I want to make sure that it work works before I post it. And there you go. All right. Next time we'll talk more form stuff. Because text boxes and submit buttons are only two of the things that you can use. There's other things that you can use as well. All right. I will go open the lab. Then I'll be back here to get my...